and welcome to On The Ledge podcast. And this week, it's all about the roots, the podcast roots. In this week's show, I'll be discussing how On The Ledge happened all those years ago. Well, three and a half, three and three quarter years ago and explaining how I make the show now. Plus, I'll be answering a question about houseplant wholesalers, and we'll hear from a fellow plant podcaster, Armando. A shout out to all my new patrons this week. Jerry's Garden, Natalie, Jennifer, Naomi and Andy all became legends, while Rachel and Jennifer became crazy palm people, and Holly and Maria became super fans. Thank you to every single one of you, and I was interested to note that somebody called Zola S, who left a review for the show on Apple Podcasts, said that their Christmas list now includes a Patreon subscription to On The Ledge. What a great idea. Do bear in mind that you can now pay annually. And remember, if you do pay annually, you end up saving two months worth of your fee. So that's another bonus. Those of you who've listened to my episode on the price of rare plants will remember that I said I'm going to be chopping up my Monster Thai constellation. Well, I'm pleased to say that the first two cuttings have gone off to their new homes with Kelly, my assistant, who definitely deserved a, a piece of that plant. And listener Lauren, who is a real OG listener with whom I've done several plant swaps over the years. And she was the source of my Chinese money plant, which she sent when I did that episode way back at the beginning of the history of the show. And I do hope the plants both grow well for Lauren and Kelly. I will be doing more chops of that monstera but it needs to get a little bit bigger and continue the chopping in spring i shall keep you posted on that what else am i up to with my house plants right now well it's just about to be that awful time of year when i have to move all of my tender succulents and cacti from my greenhouse slash potting shed into the house i've been putting it off because it's a devil of a job And I'm not quite sure where they're all going to go, but I am going to get on with it. How do you tell if your cactus or your succulent can be outside in an unheated greenhouse slash cold frame and whether it has to come inside? To be honest, it's what you might call a bit of a crapshoot. You've (laughs) you've got to keep those plants completely, completely dry if they're going to be outside in the winter going down to very low temperatures of zero centigrade or below. Some of my collection will be staying outside and that's mainly the agaves. All of the agaves that I've ever come across will be absolutely fine in my unheated shed over the winter, provided they're kept completely dry and they're in a potting mix, which is quite nice and well drained. I might stick a bit of horticultural fleece over them if it gets really super cold but the two things are really to make sure that there's some good air circulation in there so I'll be opening the doors on warmer days and letting air circulate so that the air doesn't get all stagnant and stale which could allow fungal problems to develop. I'm also leaving my Alo Aristata. I think it's actually now Aristalo Aristata. The genus has changed. The Lace Alo, which is often mistaken for Horworthia, it's my oldest plant and it always stays outside in the winter in the greenhouse, unheated, and it's absolutely fine. A real tough plant. Anything else that I'm going to keep out there? Uh, no, that's probably about it. Looking, just I'm just looking through the window uh, where I can see some of the plants from here. So I've got quite a lot of cacti and succulents to move in. I'm planning to put quite a few of them in my kitchen where I've got some new LED lights being installed and they've got a setting. They're in the ceiling, but they've got a setting where you can change the setting to daylight. So <laughs> I'm going to put some of them in the kitchen, on some shelving, uh, where they'll be under that light. It won't be a huge amount of extra light, but it'll be enough. And that room generally isn't boiling hot either. Some will come out into the office here with me where it's usually about 16 to 18 degrees centigrade. And some will be in the sunroom in the house where again, it's about 18 degrees centigrade, loads of light though in there. And they'll stay pretty dry. I would say indoors where there is a source of heat, They might be getting watered every month or two. I'll just watch out for signs of shriveling. 
So that's my job for the weekend worked out. I've also had to tidy the shed because I had a Financial Times shoot for a piece that's coming out in tomorrow's paper. That's November the 14th. About uh, It's about um, lockdown gardening, really. And it does mention houseplants, but not in any great depth. It's mainly about outside stuff. One of the plants I bought recently as a kind of an indoor outdoor plant, which I probably will bring in for a while, is Solanum pseudocapsicum. This is a member of the nightshade family, same family as tomatoes, potatoes and aubergines or eggplants if you prefer. But these are a little bit poisonous. They look very much like cherry tomatoes. If you've got small children who like to pick things and eat them, I wouldn't have this plant. But if you don't, then it's a lovely, cheery plant which can sit outside for quite a while. I probably will bring some of mine in um, once it gets super, super cold, but they will do very nicely outside provided it doesn't freeze. And in fact, there's a house near me that's got a big bush of this outside the front door, which has been there for several years. So this plant can do okay outside. But it's one of those plants that you don't want to bring into your centrally heated front room and expect it to thrive because it just won't do that. It's a bit like Cyclamen persicum, the the beautiful pastel pink or red or white flowered cyclamen, which is often sold at this time of year in florists and brought home. And again, it does lovely in an unheated room or in a very sheltered spot outside or in a covered porch or something like that. But yeah, bring it into a heated room and yeah, it's going to die. It's going to go mildewy and it's not going to be a good scenario. So I've got some of those uh, lined up to make things cheery. And I'm also enjoying some of the plants I got recently in my plant hall from a British Cactus and Succulent Society member who is downsizing his collection, including the wonderful, I'm just going to get it off the uh, windowsill, the wonderful Euphorbia platygona. Now, I think this plant is channeling the spirit of 2020 because it, it kind of looks like a dead stick. I don't know how else to put it. So it's a member of the huge Euphorbia family. I'll put a picture in the show notes so you can have a look at it. It's one of those Marmite plants that you're either going to love or hate. It's got these mottled sort of modified stems. Like all the euphorbias, you get that milky sap, which is uh, not something you want to get on your skin or in your mouth or anything. But I think it might just qualify as the ultimate goth plant. It's really, really rather cool. So that one's already made it inside the office here so I can keep a good eye on it as it establishes. And I'm very, very happy with the plants I picked up from that haul. I shall be bringing that and some more to Instagram on Perone's plants, which I'm trying to do more of at the moment. Um, so do look out for that on my Instagram at j.l.perone. And if you're not signed up to the On The Ledge newsletter, then do go and sort that out forthwith you can find a link for that in the show notes i'm trying to send it out more regularly these days because i've been rather lax about it in the past but it's your connection with the show through your email inbox and i try to highlight recent episodes cool stuff and the odd piece of merch which now includes my wonderful on the ledge manifesto poster which you can get from my uk or us merch sites you just need to go to janeperone.com and click on the shop link in the top right hand corner and you'll get directed to the right place. The poster looks gorgeous. It'll look amazing on your wall surrounded by your plants. And it sums up the philosophy of On The Ledge, uh, as well as channeling a bit of a 1970s advertising vibe. I absolutely love it. And thanks so much to Oscar Chung, who designed it for me, a listener and a graphic designer to boot. And this design will also be used in my Patreon mail out in December as a card for the legend level and a poster for the super fans. How did On The Ledge get started? Well, I think I've told this story in a few interviews for other podcasts, but I'm not sure I've ever discussed it fully here on On The Ledge. 
I've been listening to podcasts for a really long time. I think I was listening to them before most people knew what they were, not because I'm any kind of uh, amazing person, but just because I happened to have done a job where I got into blogs and podcasts and all those kind of things as part of my reporting role when I was at The Guardian, um, working on the website as it was a separate entity then, and doing a lot of uh, reporting on technology and web. And when the podcast Serial came out in 2014, I was an avid listener. And like a lot of us, Serial was that podcast that really set my mind worrying about the possibilities of this medium. So I really wanted to make a podcast, but I didn't really like the sound of my own voice and I really had no idea on the technical side. The last time I worked in audio was when I was doing my master's degree at Louisiana State University a long time ago in the 1990s. And I did a course on writing for radio broadcast and I also worked for KLSU, the uh, university's radio station. And I think I could have said absolutely anything because they just loved my accent. So I was a bit of a novelty back then and I read the news and as I say, I could have been saying absolutely anything. <laughs> so I had a rough idea of how to present things, but certainly on the technical side, I wasn't really up to speed. At the time, The Guardian was getting really into podcasting and an opportunity arose to make a gardening podcast with my colleague, Alice Fowler, who was the gardening columnist at The Guardian at the time. She used to be on Gardener's World, the BBC TV programme about gardening. And I count her as a friend. I used to edit her column on gardening in Guardian Weekend. So we decided that we could team up and make a podcast about gardening. And it ended up becoming about, I think about 15, 16 episodes recorded in 2015 and 2016. And it is still on the internet if you want to go and have a listen. Just search for So Grow Repeat and my name and you'll find it. But I'll also put links in the show notes. And boy, did we have fun. We did everything from Alice Fowler teaching me how to climb trees to getting drunk at the Chelsea Flower Show to talking garden wildlife, including the size of hedgehog genitalia. <laughs> Do you want to hear an extract? Here's a bit of So Grow Repeat. Hi, we're back for an episode of So Grow Repeat and we're at Chelsea. Now it's horrendously wet outside so pretty much all of Chelsea has decided to come into the floral pavilion to try and drink all the free champagne and we're going to do our best attempt to do that, but also find you some Chelsea gems. Perfect. Oh! That is unbelievable. <laughs> That's the most fun I've had. Absolutely perfect. I love that. That was lovely, Alice. Well done. Congratulations. May I introduce you now as a, as a subrose? Oh, thank you. So I've made it up to about... I mean, what are we, Alice, about... We're the first set of limbs we're already you know we're already 12 foot up so you know you've got you've got somewhere uh, and you've got over the trickiest bit because that first move you had to kind of smear on the trunk and it's a little bit of trusting the tree there was a little bit of smearing that's true and it is really we were just saying it's mind over matter that you believe you can do it and you do it and it's already feeling quite nice there's a bit more of a breeze up here and you've got a nice view and I'm feeling slightly less panicky than I did a few seconds ago, so that's good. And also, I'm liking that you can kind of see what the tree's doing. So th this oak is just coming into leaf now, and behind us there's a hawthorn which is just about to burst its buds. And you're getting a different moment with the tree, which is rather nice. Listening to that brings back so many happy memories of fun times with my colleague Alice Fowler. <laughs> You can tell we had fun, can't you? And we also won an award for the show, a Garden Media Guild Award for the best radio broadcast or podcast in 2016. And in fact, I had to persuade them to allow us to put the podcast in that category because they wanted to call us an app. <laughs> Back in the days before podcasts becoming quite as ubiquitous as they are today. 
But the Guardian decided not to make any more. And so by 2017, I was bereft of podcasts. And as you know, if you've been listening to the show for a while, I've got a lifelong fascination for houseplants. And at that time, I could really see that houseplants were starting to build in popularity. And it had happened before where an idea that I had for a book or an article, I just sat on it. And inevitably, somebody else would have that same idea independent of me and go ahead and make it. And I was pipped to the post. And on this one, I just thought, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know how to make a podcast, but I'm not going to let anyone else beat me to it. (laughs) So after much cogitation and research and a helpful chat with a chap called Peter Donegan, who made a podcast called The Sod Show, on which I have been a guest a couple of times. It's no longer made, but it was a wonderful show and went for many years. And Peter just said to me, I'm not going to impersonate his Irish accent. Just do it, Jane. Just go for it. So I did. And On The Ledge began. And at first, I think I was probably trying to imitate the BBC. So those early episodes, they're a bit more scripted, probably than more recent work I've done. I hardly dare listen back to them now, but I know lots of you end up listening to them as you binge your way through the show. But uh, I started off with the idea that I wanted to make it fun. And that's why in those early episodes, I had my wonderful friend Mark Hamilton doing some funny little interludes. Um, I decided to drop those in the end because I just felt like uh, I was just going to keep repeating the same old thing over and over again. And uh, some people loved them. Some people didn't like them. But I decided in the end that they might get a bit a bit repetitive so hence uh, that that was dropped after a few episodes and listening back i think i've become a lot more confident in the way i present on the ledge i don't script every episode so how the hell do i make it well generally i'll have a list of bullet points that i want to talk about which is all gathered in a rather grandly titled spreadsheet called the On The Ledge Master Plan. So I've got information about the stuff I need to say about reviews and patron beyond subscribers. And I'll also have a, a, a Word document opened up with bullet points about the topic we're discussing. And if I'm doing an interview, of course, I'll have lined up some questions in advance. But I'm a bit notorious for going off piste and ending up asking guests questions that I haven't planned on. So, but I guess that's how the show gets its kind of organic feel, that it doesn't feel like a very staid kind of scripted thing. It feels like more of a natural conversation between plant people. But what I would say about that is, although it does make the show sound much more natural, it's actually quite hard to do. What it means is when I'm recording, sometimes I'll be formulating what I want to say as I go along. And therefore, there's quite a lot of editing required oftentimes because I'll just mess things up Uh, or the dog will jump off the sofa and make a noise or somebody will rev up their lawnmower. So there's a lot of editing that goes on and that is a really important component of the show. What do I use to edit? Well, the editing package that I use is called Audacity. It's a free open source package, which was the main appeal. And I've kind of got used to using it. I'm sure there are other audio packages which would offer more frills and more bells and whistles. But um, I've spent so much time getting used to Audacity and learning how to use it. And I don't really have the time to learn another package. It kind of does everything that I need it to do. And so I've stuck with it. I tend to record the raw audio and then go through and edit out all the fluffs and mistakes that I've made and then build up the audio in layers. So I usually have one track, which is me talking, that what I call, it's always labeled JP host for some reason. And then I'll have another track, which will be the, some music and then another track, which is a sound effect. And then possibly two more tracks, which are my interview audio, if there's an interview in that episode. And it's a question of juggling all of those different tracks and making sure that everything fits together time wise. I would not say I'm the world's best editor, but the way I work, I have tried using editors before and they've been great, but I find that the way I work, which is, let's face it, a little bit on the fly, is uh, more conducive to editing myself because that way I can change things quickly and all the control is in my hands. Well, and I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a control freak. So yes, I want to be able to see everything that's going on. In terms of interviews, it's great to do interviews in the flesh. And for that, I have, let me just grab it. I have a... 
I have a little handheld recorder made by Roland. It's a it's an R05 recorder and I really should get a microphone that fits in this. But for the minute, I can just sit this on the table between me and an interviewee and it picks everything up quite nicely. There's a little hat which you can put on it if you're doing outside recording, because the peril of outside recording is you get lots of noise from wind and the, the recorder gets kind of battered and the white noise is too much. So I have a little foamy hat that sits on top of it which is quite funny uh, when I'm recording outside but if you don't have one of those and you want to do some recording outside you know what most phones do really really good voice recording you can I, I've got a Samsung S I think it's an S8 at the moment and I've done recording on that and the quality is actually really really good you just use the voice app that comes with the phone and away you go. You can also buy microphones that will fit into your iPhone or Android phone and that makes the quality even better. Talking of microphones, in terms of my microphone here in the office, I use a Rode Podcaster and it's mounted on a boom arm. I'll put a picture of this in the show notes. I'll have to tidy my desk first because it's a tip, but, <laughs> but you can see what it looks like. So it's sat in a shock mount. I'm going to give it a wobble. Probably, I don't know if you can hear that, but anyway. Um, it's in a shock mount and on a boom arm. So what that means is I can use this desk for other things. So I can literally just, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to sound distant for a minute. So I pushed it right out the way and it's right out of my road. And then I can bring it back in and reposition it. And it makes life so easy. Before this, I had a Blue Yeti microphone. It didn't last that long because you know what? I dropped it so many times moving it about. <laughs> Uh, that's because when I very first started recording, I didn't really have the office set up for uh, my use. So I was recording in my bedroom, the room I share with my husband, and the recording would take place with me perched on a, the world's smallest chair. I will take a photo of the world's smallest chair so you can see it with my husband's chest of drawers open with the top drawer pulled open and the computer nestled on his socks and underpants. <laughs> That's how I used to do it. And actually it worked quite well because the key to good recording is often that you don't have an echoey room with no soft furnishings. Lots of soft furnishings tend to dampen the echoes and make the show sound much better. So that worked really well. And then I got things set up out here and this is where I've worked ever since. If you do have a microphone and you've got a lot of echoes and you don't have a lot of soft furnishings, you can make your own little tiny mini sound booth for your microphone. And I did have one of those. It's literally just a fabric box. I think you can buy them in Ikea and um, places like B&Q or whatever your local uh, big box DIY store is. And then I just lined the inside with foam, uh, acoustic foam tiles, which you can buy online and then pop the microphone in there. And that really helped to dampen down the sound. You can also sit and record under a blanket or a duvet. Not so great when it's boiling hot and 30 degrees in your office. So um, that's not necessarily going to work. Or if you've got a, like a wardrobe or a cupboard, a big walk-in wardrobe. I know lots of you in America are lucky enough to have more space than we do here in the UK. But if you've got one of those, you can use that because anything that dampens down the sound is great. So I'm often to be found at my desk trying to record stuff. And generally speaking, what happens is that I'm trying to record and then I'll see a face at the window. If it's my son, he'll usually just burst in. Uh, if it's my husband, he'll sort of stand at the door looking, questioning or making the symbols for tea. And <laughs> so frequent interruptions are par for the course. But that's that's life. That's part of the rich tapestry. And if you're a regular listener to the show and you listen to episode 100, you'll know that I'm also frequently interrupted by seeing cool birds in the garden. And this happened this very morning uh, when I was trying to record some of this show and saw a sparrow hawk chasing another smaller bird in a neighbouring garden. So it's all going on here. Uh, yes, I love bird watching and I could sit here all day and do it. But obviously uh, the podcast takes precedence. <laughs> And the other thing that's been interrupting recently, there's a lot of building work going on around me. I've tried to work around it and 
make sure that you don't end up hearing lots of bangs and crashes on the audio but I apologize if you have been hearing anything but there is literally massive building projects happening on all sides around me at the moment so yes it can get a little noisy. Obviously, since I started on the ledge, so many other houseplant podcasts have popped up. I think one of the first ones I was aware of was Bloom and Grow Radio with the lovely Maria Faella, which you, if you know, remember, I did an interview with Maria, which was absolutely wonderful. And I've appeared on her show. And since then, there's been loads more from the Plant Daddy podcast, who you'll also have heard as interviewees on On the Ledge to the Australian House Plant podcast, Home of House Plants with Joe Housky, The Plant Nook by the lovely Armando, Potted Together, The Black Plant Chick podcast with Jade, and Two Girls, One Plant. There's a new one from iHeartRadio called Humans Growing Stuff, which I haven't had a chance to listen to yet, but I'm looking forward to trying out. And probably it's loads more that I've forgotten. Do let me know what other houseplant podcasts you like listening to. I'll put links to all of those in my show notes as well, in case you want to check them out. But people have said to me, oh, are you not annoyed that all these people starting these uh, houseplant podcasts as if they're some kind of competitor? Well, of course not. I'm delighted to have houseplant podcasts to listen to that I don't have to make. And also they're all so different. We've all got different personalities, different backstories. And so we bring our own vibes to our houseplant podcast, which is what makes it so great. How do I come up with ideas for episodes for the show? Well, lots of the best ideas come from you listeners. It's fantastic to get those emails where you say, what about this or what about that? And the Croton episode recently came about because of an email from a listener called Jenny. And I've just had a lovely email from a listener called Bryce from the eastern US who says that they're an avid grower of Trichocereus cacti hybrids among a host of other domesticated flora. This was such a lovely email because it shows the reach and impact of On The Ledge. After listening to the tissue culture episode, Bryce decided to go to Seedless Labs to learn about tissue culture. And Bryce writes, I've always desired a career in plant and have a passion for science. Without trying to sound too grand, I'd like you to know that your podcast may well have altered my life path much for the better. Wow, that's that's really special to hear. And those are the kind of emails that keep me going. So if you if the show has had a big impact on your life, then I'd really like to know about it because it really does make my heart sing to hear that. Um, And in this email, Bryce suggested that I do an episode on his favourites, the Trichocereus and the Areocarpus genus. And writes, the native peoples here revere these plants and the adoration of them has spread into a worldwide community of incredibly knowledgeable and wonderfully kind, starry eyed devotees. Well, I want to know more about this, Bryce. So, yes, I will definitely be tracking down somebody to talk to about these plants and an episode will be forthcoming. Sometimes, though, I want to do an episode and it's just really, really hard to, to get it together. Um, sometimes the experts that I want to speak to uh, just aren't technically set up to use Zoom and it would be far easier to visit them in person. But of course, right now, that's not always easy. And lots of the experts that I would be speaking to or would want to visit are based not in my own country here in the UK. I would love to do a US tour at some point and go and do loads of interviews and things. Obviously, that's off the agenda at the moment. But you never know. One of these days I might get over to the US and be able to meet some of you in person. And I'm also aware that some new friendships have been forged as a result of On The Ledge. Some of you have ended up swapping plants and getting to know each other as a result of the show. And if you aren't a member of the Facebook group Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge and you fancy getting a bit of that action of making friends with other plant people, then do join that group. It is the most drama free group on the internet for houseplants. We do not allow any drama. It does not happen. Everybody is nice to everybody else. And it's very, very carefully curated by my moderators, Amy, Nathaniel, Kelly, and also occasionally myself. But there's not much moderation to do because you're all such decent people, which is fab. At any one time, I will have half a dozen to a dozen episode ideas in my noggin and in some stage of production. So, for example, at the minute, I've got a couple of ideas about 
the poaching trade and I'm hoping to get an expert on to talk about cactus poaching because I think that's a really important issue that we need to be looking into. I'm also hoping to get some really good information together for an episode on the history of houseplants in terms of slavery, obviously something which we've touched on in previous episodes around Black Lives Matter in the spring. More leaf botany episodes are in the pipe, including one on leaf windows. And I am also hoping to put together an episode about viruses, specifically mosaic virus, because this is an issue that's really coming up in the world of plants, particularly the aroid world. And I've been speaking to an expert in this area who hopefully will be able to help me with that. Also on the wish list for episodes, staghorn ferns, jewel orchids and plant cabinets. If there's anything else you'd like me to do an episode on, then please do shout because, as I say, I'm totally open to ideas. And I've also been getting very excited, uncharacteristically for me, because I'm not the biggest fan of Christmas, but I've been getting very excited about an idea I've had. In fact, I've started to make the show for a bonus festive episode which I think I'm going to put out on Christmas Eve and it's going to be a bit like the relaxation episode in that it's going to be me reading something which is not written by myself and I'm hoping it's going to be a really lovely way to relax into Christmas and just chill out and and listen to my dulcet tones and so that's being put together as I speak it's going to something I'll probably be doing in dribs and drabs over the coming weeks. I've been searching out some good music for it and I found some really nice music. So yeah, you know, I like to pick some good music for you guys. So that's an exciting one. I will probably also take a week or two off over Christmas just so I can recharge the old batteries. I will let you know the exact dates once I've sorted those out. What about some advice for anyone who's thinking of starting a plant podcast or in fact, any other kind of podcast? Well, first of all, I would say do your research, but also don't be paralysed by a fear of not knowing what you are doing. (laughs) The only way to learn is to do. And so when I started out with podcasting, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I pieced the information together and I just started. And that's how you learn. How did I learn how to use the editing software Audacity? Well, I just downloaded it and then when I didn't know what a button did, I'd Google what does the clock button do on Audacity and there would be a YouTube video to watch and I'd figure it out. So that really is a great a great way of um, learning on the hoof. That, the other thing I'd say is don't just go in there thinking I'm going to just talk or perhaps that it's a if it's more than one person hosting the show oh we're just going to shoot the breeze uh unless you are a very very famous person or you've got an incredible skill for conversation I don't think these days that's going to stand out among the crowd in podcasting because there are so many podcasts out there I think you need to come up with your own concept that plays to your strengths and your knowledge areas And remember that you are unique and your voice is unique. And so you will bring something unique to that show. Consistency is also key. I started from the beginning trying to put on the ledge out every week. And I really do find that that is a great way to build your podcast. It may be that you decide to do fortnightly. That means every two weeks, if you don't know that term. I've been bemused by the fact that Americans don't have the word fortnight, but you do have the word fortnight because it's a computer game. I don't know. Anyway, every two weeks, you know what I mean? fortnightly or monthly or every day who knows what your what your frequency is going to be but whatever it is decide it and then stick to it I have chosen not to do seasons I've chosen just to take weeks off when I want to that's just because that's the way I work and I'm not strategic enough to be thinking in terms of seasons so it's fine to have seasons if you want to whatever you do make a plan and try to stick to it At the same time, and I'm going to slightly contradict myself here, your show may well evolve. So, you know, you may find that a different publication day works well and you may lose a host or gain a host. That's all okay. But whatever you do, just try to get into that habit, that podcast habit, and that will really help you find success with your show. If you have a gardening podcast of any kind or you're setting one up, then I do run a Facebook group for garden podcasters. And if you are interested in that, please drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and I can send you an invite to that group. And there's also a wonderful guide to making a garden podcast for beginners. 
produced by the wonderful podcaster Joff Elphick, who runs the Pot and Cloche Gardening Podcast. And that is a guide to starting a gardening podcast. So definitely that is worth checking out. Find the link in the show notes. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little trip down memory lane and an insight into how On The Ledge works. If you've got any questions about the show or starting your own podcast about gardening, do check out the resources in those show notes and you can always drop me a line. I'm more than happy to help if I possibly can. And now... It's Meet the Listener, and this week we're going to be introduced to a fellow houseplant podcaster. Hi, I'm Armando. I'm from Syracuse, New York, and I have been an avid plant grower for a little over a year now. I've been into plants ever since I could remember. My mom and my grandma both owned gardens. My grandma did ornamental gardens and my mom had edible gardens and I've always helped them grow their plants. Um, And then I went to college and studied conservation biology and really focused in on plant ecology. But it wasn't until more recently that I really started getting into house plants. I have two cats and I was kind of nervous of having plants in the first place because I knew that a lot of the house plants were technically toxic to cats but I was like all right let me take the plunge and so I did and found out that my cats don't really care about my plants so I was able to grow my collection from basically nothing to about 110 different species of plants in about a year and since starting I started my own plant Instagram and I actually also started my podcast and that was after listening to you on 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 the ledge and to plant daddy podcast i was so inspired that i wanted to talk about my experience with houseplants and decided to take it a step further and start my own podcast question one you've been selected to travel to mars as part of the first human colony on the red planet there's only room for one houseplant from your collection on board which plant do you choose Ooh, so if I were to travel to Mars and only had w- room for one houseplant, see, I would want to say like, oh, I'd want to take something like my Alocasia fry deck or something. But I think if I were to be sent to Mars, I'd take something really reliable. I think I'll take an Epipremnum aureum, just a golden pothos, because I know that it will grow and it will do well enough and maybe even help oxygenate Mars. Question two. What is your favorite episode of On The Ledge? So I actually have a couple of favorite episodes. I tried to pick one, but I really couldn't. Um, My first one would probably be the the first episode I've ever listened to On The Ledge, which is episode 113, where you talk about winterizing your plants with Plant Daddy Podcast, Matthew and Steven. My first ever plant podcast that I've ever listened to was Plant Daddy Podcast. And so I started with them. And then you had that one interview where you were on their podcast and they then were on yours. And so I went to go listen to them to number 113 because they were on it. And I just absolutely fell in love with On The Ledge. So that's definitely one of my favorites. But the other ones would have to be where you talk about sustainability. So I believe one of them is episode 114 and the other one is episode 103. And that's all I've really listened to while well, I'm up to about 130 now. And so those, I think, might be my some of my favorites only because since I did study conservation biology, sustainability is a huge aspect of what I do when I care for plants and try and be as sustainable as possible. So I absolutely love the topics of sustainability. Question three, which Latin name do you say to impress people? So if I'm trying to impress people with Latin names, I actually don't use houseplants in particular. Granted, you know, there's a bunch of beautiful Latin names for houseplants, but my usual go-tos are treats. My first one is liquid ambar stereosiflua, which is the sweet gum tree. And the next one is Gladitia tricanthos, which is the honey locust. They're both actually a couple of my favorite trees, and so I use that if I want to get fancy with the Latin names. Question four, crassulation, acid metabolism, or gatation? So most of my plants are leafy foliage plants, so I'd probably go with gatation. I'm not really too keen on succulents and cacti, which use crassulation acid metabolism, uh, mostly because I don't have the light to have those types of plants. 
but I'm hoping that soon enough I'll get more grow lights and I can start to try and grow more cacti and succulents because they are really interesting and I would love my chance at growing them. Question 5. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? So as of right now, since I don't have the light for the cacti, I'd probably choose the variegated monstera. If I was able to choose between what type of variegated monstera, I'd probably go with the Thai constellation because I think I would freak out too much if I were to go with the Albo variegata because since it's not a stable variegation, I would be so on edge that I might ruin the plant. And I know that Thai constellation is more stable. So I'd probably go with a variegated monstera, but the Thai constellation one. Thanks so much to Armando and the plant Nook. That's Nook as in rhymes with book is definitely worth a listen. I shall put a link into the show notes and good luck with your podcast Armando. It's shaping up very nicely. And now it's time for question of the week, which comes from Lily. And Lily is looking for houseplant wholesalers, ideally near to the West Midlands. Great question, Lily, and one that I get asked an awful lot because there are so many people setting up their own houseplant businesses right now. Here's the trouble, though. People who have a good relations with a houseplant wholesaler generally don't want anyone else to know who that houseplant wholesaler is. Um, it's a bit of a closed world. Normally, the world of houseplants is fairly open. But once you get into the business side of things, people don't really want to give away their sources likely. So it's very difficult for me to say, oh, go here or go there, not least because obviously I've got listeners all around the world. I'm not in the West Midlands of the UK, so I don't know which wholesalers are active there. It's one of those things where you've got to kind of do your research and it might take a while to get the trust of a fellow houseplant seller and find out who they're working with. One nursery worth checking out is in Staffordshire, and that's Harriet's Plants. This is a UK grower who is growing peat-free and is producing houseplants wholesale. I'm hoping to visit Harriet once lockdown is over here in the UK and do a podcast episode with her. Uh, but she's definitely worth checking out. She also sells indoor plants and botanical wares online. But as I say, there is a wholesale operation there too. And wonderful that that's peat free, because as anyone who listens regularly will know, that's a bit of a bee in my bonnet that we all need to be growing peat free houseplants. The other thing worth bearing in mind is that after the end of 2020, if you're in the UK, the situation regarding Brexit, Britain leaving the EU is going to change the houseplant scene quite considerably. I'm predicting that it's going to mean a blossoming of more UK based houseplant nurseries as it becomes more difficult and expensive to import from the Netherlands, the main site of houseplant growing in Europe. But we really don't know what the impact's going to be. So it's going to be really interesting in the coming months and years to see how the industry develops. That's it for this week's On The Ledge. I'll be back next Friday. In the meantime, never forget. Keep your fronds close and your anemones even closer. music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, Chiefs by Jazar, and Endeavour by Jazar. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details. Music